Since its early beginnings, Earth has been under a constant bombardment by objects from our solar system. Generally, this bombardment doesn't affect our lives very much, because our planet's atmosphere is thick enough that very few of these objects ever actually reach the ground. Most of them burn up in brief flashes that we can see in the night sky as shooting stars. Occasionally, though, Earth crosses paths with objects that are large enough to penetrate the atmosphere, and even hit the ground. To date, scientists have identified more than 40 impact craters that are over 20 kilometers in diameter, and many more smaller than that. Standing on the rim of one of these craters leaves one with no doubt of the awesome potential these objects have to change the face of the Earth. These craters were caused by what would today be identified as near-Earth objects, or NEOs. Generally either rocky asteroids or icy comets, what distinguishes NEOs is that their orbits come close to or cross the orbit of the Earth, which introduces the possibility of an eventual collision. Since the asteroid Eros was first identified as a near-Earth object, there has been an increasing amount of attention paid to NEOs. Engineers and scientists are working on a variety of questions. What are NEOs? How did they come to have orbits across Earth's? How can we tell if one might hit our planet? And if we find one that might, is there anything we can do about it? The Space Generation Advisory Council is proud to present this short film highlighting some of the answers to the many questions about near-Earth objects. Given enough time, every NEO is fated to either hit a planet, fall into the sun, or be thrown from the inner solar system. Any of these objects were formed at the same time as the solar system, some four and a half billion years ago, would certainly have suffered one of those three fates by now. Yet there are hundreds of thousands of NEOs that have been tracked and cataloged. Since they haven't always been there, there must be some mechanism at work that brings these objects into their current orbit from somewhere else. NEOs are near-Earth objects, um, so they're asteroids in orbits that cross the Earth's orbit. Um, they originated in the main belt, so generally they were orbiting the Sun in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, but they interacted with Jupiter and that changed their orbit, and so now their orbits cross Earth's orbit. Different physical processes, uh, resonances, or harmonic kind of interactions between the planets, can cause them to come in into orbits where they enter the inner belt. There is a force called the Yarkovsky effect which causes orbits to drift a bit because of solar light pressure and those can cause them to drift into a resonance so that it's sort of like a pendulum and as they come into the resonance they start swinging more widely in their orbit and then they come in and cross the Earth's orbit. And if they cross, if their orbit crosses Earth's orbit, there's a risk that they could collide with the Earth. These processes take millions of years, so they don't happen. They don't suddenly appear. Uh, we have to discover them, of course, but it's not like we have to be constantly vigilant for a new one that gets into a crazy orbit. So most known NEOs are main belt asteroids that have had their orbits altered by influences from the Sun and the other planets. But what exactly are they? What are they made of? So O in NEO stands for object. And there are two types of these objects, asteroids and comets. The asteroids, um, they basically will be formed of the same materials that form the inner planets, so the rocks will be quite similar to that found in the Earth. Whereas um, if they come from the outer solar system, i.e. comets, then they'll be mostly icy um, objects, which um, most of the icy stuff would have probably melted away by now, so it's just like the remnant dust or whatever is left up. And so these asteroids can be like a big chunk of a mountain, just a solid piece of rock, or they can be made of smaller pieces that can be as small as an inch that are held together by big gravitational force. But you can't tell that just by looking at them. And astronomical observations, they're just little specks in the sky. They're not even resolved. So for the vast majority of the ones we know about, we have no idea what their structure is. We don't know what their shape is. We don't know that much about them. We only know their orbits. Whether pebble-sized or mountain-sized, NEOs are tiny compared to the vastness of the solar system. They also reflect very little of the sunlight that strikes them. Finding tiny, dim objects in a very large, dark sky would be difficult at best. Yet there are several professional groups and thousands of amateur astronomers worldwide that are actively hunting NEOs. What do they use to find them? To look for very small objects, which are very faint, then you have to have a very big telescope. So you can have $100 telescope you can buy in Radio Shack, you can find some. 
But if you want to find very tiny ones, then you need a billion dollar telescope. One such telescope is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, or LSST, which is planned to begin construction in 2010 in Chile. Its 8.4 meter mirror will be able to spot NEOs as small as 100 meters in diameter. But how can a telescope tell you if an NEO is going to hit the Earth? You take uh, two or three images during the, the night spaced out by 40 or 50 minutes, and then you compare those on the computer. So you do a subtraction of the two frames and see what moves. And when you see things that move, then you put those together in what's called a tracklet, a little trail of motion. So, you know, the position and the rate of motion, that allows you to find it again tomorrow or next week. Once you've done that about three different nights, you can calculate an orbit. How many of the NEOs that have been discovered are actually dangerous? Not all NEOs are dangerous because definition of NEO is that their orbit crosses orbit of Earth. But actually to get collision with Earth, then you have to be at the same time at the same place. And so these are called potentially hazardous asteroids and they make few percent of all NEOs. Our current estimate of the population uh, is a approximately a thousand larger than one kilometer in diameter. I mean, one kilometer size is large enough to cause uh, global consequences. If such an object were to hit the Earth, it, it could uh, cause a global catastrophe, a climatic global warming kind of thing, or cooling, uh, which could be extremely hazardous. Now, we have actually found most of those objects, and none of them are going to hit us. Uh, as you go to smaller size, then you're dealing with uh, things that can cause a regional disaster, perhaps of the magnitude of the uh, tsunami from Indonesia of some years ago. And there are perhaps a million objects that uh, could cause such damage as that. On June 30th, 1908, an explosion occurred in the skies above the sparsely populated Tunguska River region in Siberia. The force of the blast leveled an estimated 80 million trees over an area the size of Washington, D.C generally accepted cause of this event is an NEO on the order of just 10 meters in diameter. What if a similar sized object impacted somewhere else on the planet, maybe in the ocean or close to or on top of a city? It's the characteristics of the land. If you hit the land in a city, it generates casualties no matter really how big the object is. If it hits 20 kilometers outside of the city, then the mitigation is significant. So you've got this large dependence on displacement for land impacts, whereas in ocean impacts it doesn't really matter, it's on, you know, the same area that's going to generate casualties. Scientists, engineers, space lawyers, and political policy advisors worldwide have come together and created a whole new discipline called planetary defense. Planetary defense is the development and evaluation of technologies that might one day protect us from a major collision with an NEO. Planetary defense is a very young field, and one of the challenges is to know what's going on throughout the world uh, re that relates to this particular topic. So one of the purposes of the conference is to bring the experts together on a periodic basis, as it's going to be every two years right now, where we can learn what's going on throughout the world that would affect our ability to, to mitigate a threat like this if we ever have to. The 2009 IAA Planetary Defense Conference held in Grenada, Spain, allowed experts from around the world to talk about their research and to meet their international counterparts.